as people are coming in, let's stand um, and pray before we begin with the ritual. Sounds great. God, we thank you for this morning and for the rain. We thank you for the thunder that communicates your power and your majesty. You are worthy of our praise and we give you this morning of um, worship as we look into your word and we glorify you and want to hear from you. So we give you this morning. Oh, man. me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I want to allow that, allow these words, if you need to look up here or open your, your 
Bible to Psalm 23. And I just want you to, to pray to the Lord and, and thank the Lord for being your shepherd. Thank the Lord for leading you beside still waters in the midst of life's turmoil and chaos. Thank the Lord for restoring your soul and for leading you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then be reminded, maybe perhaps the most comforting, but maybe the most difficult, is that even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that you don't have to fear evil. Why? Because God is with you, even in the midst of that. For his rod and his staff, they comfort you. And then even in the presence of your enemies, he prepares a table. He anoints you. And the goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And so take just a moment. Whatever the Spirit leads you and prompts you to pray, just to pray to God. Thank Him for that. Maybe, maybe it's a psalm that is a while comforting. Maybe you're struggling to believe it and say, God, help me to see this. Help me to believe this this morning. I know that it's true because your word says it's true, but I'm struggling to believe it. Or maybe you do believe it and you just want to praise God for that. So take a moment now and just pray that to God. I would thank you for being our good, good shepherd. That you don't save us and then just leave us, but you're there to guide us with your rod and your staff, and that they comfort us. God, even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as we walk through tribulation and suffering and some of us persecution and just various forms, God, that you are with us and that you do not leave us. And that even in the midst of chaos or a chaotic world, that we can have peace that surpasses all understanding because it comes from you. And God, may we be surrounded by your goodness, your faithfulness, all the days of our lives. So God, we thank you for, you for that. We thank you for your goodness in our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness. May it shape us, may it mold us in how it is that we walk through any area of life. Whether it's a season of good, or bad, or in between knowing that we look to our good, good shepherd who's comforting us, who's leading us, who's guiding us. Thank you for being that in our lives. Thank you for that reminder this morning for those of us who needed to hear it. We love you. Amen. Would you stand with us again?
as we're praying through the God of thunder and rain, through the God whose love never fails, through the God who loves each one of us and our unique um, flaws and eccentricities and the little things that make us unique, you love each one of us. So as we stand in awe and reverence of you, we remind you that you have chosen to come down to this earth, to live a life between the earth, and die the death between God, and love us each in the way that only you as we look into Romans, may our hearts be open to hear from you and to be changed by you. We give you this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the kids are dismissed, would you remain standing for the reading of Scripture? shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'd just like to pray. Um, God, what a message just in that one passage. It's overwhelming. Um, I just pray over the message that you've given to Matt to deliver to us this morning, that um, our hearts are open, that the Holy Spirit is in this room, ready to move each one of us with something um, really special and um, pertinent to our lives today. Just give you all the praise, all the glory. Um, just we're ready to move, we're ready to be open in your praise. message in our series, Light in the Spirit, through Romans chapter 8, since we're going to turn there if you haven't already in your copy of Scripture. Um, I trust by now that you see why Romans 8 is considered to be one of the most powerful and encouraging um, chapters in the entire Bible. I think it's one that you can return to again and again, whether you're struggling with something, when you find yourself uncertain about life and maybe where you're at or if you're facing tragedy or even death itself. And so um, I encourage you wherever you're at this morning to continue to return to Romans chapter 8. Like any series, I always get a little sad whenever we actually wrap them up because I feel like I get so immersed in it. I felt that way with Ecclesiastes and I moved right into Romans 8, so here we are. But Romans 8 started by telling us what? Does anybody remember? There no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? That is how we started this series. And what an encouraging reminder for us that this is the good news. That 
We were condemned, but once we're in Christ, in Christ, by the way, we no longer have to be condemned. And as a result, the Spirit of God is working within us. It's in our life to help us to conquer sin and death and to bear witness to new creation. And so that's how we start. We said we really have to start there in order to understand the rest of the chapter and how it all links together. Well, this chapter is going to end with the promise of there's no separation for God's children. That it's going to tell us that there's nothing that can separate us from God's love. There's nothing that can get between us as his children and his love for us. And so Paul is going to introduce his summary statement in verses 31 through 37, where he essentially asks the question, what shall we say in response to all that we've heard over these last several weeks? And so our main idea this morning... <coughs> is that God's love for followers of Jesus is secure and nothing can separate us from that love. And so Paul's going to ask these four questions. And he asks these questions in order to proclaim what will ultimately be, that no one will ultimately be able to separate us from God's love. So here's the four questions, and we're, this is what we'll be looking at. First, he's going to ask us, who can be against us? Second, he'll ask us, who can bring a charge against us? Third, he will ask, who will condemn us? And fourth, he will ask us, who can separate us? Now, I'm going to go ahead and let you know the answer to all four questions. This doesn't mean you shouldn't listen, but the answer to all four questions is nothing. Shortest sermon ever. There it is. Here's the questions. Here's the answers. Let's pray, sing another song of glory, and go and be the church. We'll all go get gravy before it gets too crowded. But Paul is going to provide followers of Jesus with gospel-centered assurance. And so this is kind of the final celebratory passage as he brings it to a conclusion where he proclaims this security and certainty for us as God's children. So let me pray for us one more time, and then we're going to get into these questions and these verses. Father God, I thank you once again that we can gather. God, I thank you for this space that's been provided. Although there's nothing special about it, it's special this morning because your children are gathering here. As I look out and see beautiful faces of men, women, and children. God, people who love you, who want to model their life after the way that you lived and how the rhythm that you gave us. God, I ask now that you speak to us once again as we finish up Romans chapter 8. And God, specifically, if there's someone in here or someone listening who has forgotten about your everlasting love for them, that you're reminded of that fresh this morning. We love you. Amen. So number one this morning, first question is, who can be against us? Look at verse chapter 8. I highly encourage you, if you've never read it, or just go back and reread it, re reread through all of it. But he has un relentlessly unfolded the good news of the gospel. And a lot of it has been here in chapter 8, as he's kind of re uh, gone over some of the stuff he's previously gone over. So here's a few, a few things that we've gathered from this. Through Christ, we are justified before God. Through Christ, we are reconciled to God. Through Christ, we enjoy peace with God. Through Christ, we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. Through Christ, we are not condemned before God. Through Christ, we are adopted as children of God. Through Christ, we have glorified hope in God. Through Christ, we have help in the Spirit of God. Through Christ, we are called by God. And through Christ, we have certainty in all things that he is working for the good of those who love him. It's all through Christ. And so we find Paul's answer to the question in the second part of verse 31. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now don't miss this. This is the good news for every child of God. The God is for us. God is for you. When you feel the weight of the world against you, when you feel your employer against you, when you feel your family against you, when you feel like no one understands you, nobody gets you, God is for you. Say that with me. God is for you. And many in the world will oppose you. It doesn't say that that won't happen. But regardless of what happens, that God is for you. Sure, we live in a fallen world. There will be pain. Amen? Testimony to that, right? There will be hardship. Some of you may have faced some of that this week. But we must not think in the flesh. Remember, he's kind of told us about these two ways. We think in the flesh or we think according to the Spirit. But in the flesh, we get deceived by these things. We start questioning God. And so he's reminding us here that even as Christians, yes, we will deal with hardships. We will deal with spiritual warfare. 
The powers of evil and darkness may come against us, but they will not prevail. That's what we need to grasp, is that they will come against us. I think sometimes we think it's not normal for them to come They will come against us. We're told that. But they will not prevail. Why not? Who's for us? God. God is for us. And so they will not prevail, but God will prevail. And if God is for us, then it says, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Nobody. Say that with me. Nobody. God is for us. Who can be against us? Nobody. So think of it like this. That God, who has purposed our glory, is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. So why are we afraid of opposition at all? We, we know that it's normal and that it will come, but we do not have to fear it, and this is why it tells us right here. You know, it's, it's hard when you think about this, that Almighty God, is, Almighty God is for us. Can you think of a more powerful, greater truth? Like God, the God of the universe, who created all things, including you and me. God who is all-knowing, omnipotent, over all things, all-sufficient. That God is for you. Like, you are on the winning team. There is no doubt. Right? We can't even, like, get generations here. It's like having Michael Jordan and LeBron James both on your team, both in their prime, and playing against a elementary basketball team. Right? Like, there's, like, no question and no doubt who's going to win. So we're on the winning team. Tom, Tom Schreiner says, He, God, will vanquish any enemies that present themselves before believers. So God is for us. Now that sounds good to say. It's like a rallying cry, right? We can storm down the steps here and the thunder and lightning maybe will come back. We're like, God is for us. But how can we be sure? It's one thing to rally up and say, but how can we be sure, especially when it doesn't feel like it? Especially when we get in our feelings based on life circumstances that we're like, God is for us. Man, it doesn't feel like it. I'm walking through some pain. So what are we to do? Verse 32, it reinforces this point. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Here's the reminder. If you want to know that God is for you, look to the cross. God did not spare his own son. How will he not also give us all things? In other words, God is working in Christ for us at the cross to ensure of God's continued grace toward us both now in the present and forever in the future. And so when you question God's love for you and you you forget his love for you, look to the cross and what happened there. He's getting to this. Paul's saying God has done one of the hardest things of all. He gave up his own Son. And as a result, we can rest assured that all of these lesser things are, are easier things that he will grant us everything. This actually points back a little bit last week, if you were with us or if you weren't with us, they talked about that everything that happens, that God is working all things together for our good and for his glory. And so this is pointing back that, that uh, just to that point, that God is working all things that happen in your life, the good and the bad and the ugly, everything. He is using it for your good as he's weaving together and making you more and more, conforming you more and more to the image of his son. Now, to be clear, this is not a prosperity message implying that God will give us everything we've ever wanted. That's a misuse and abuse of the text. So that's not what this is implying here. But what he is saying is that God did not redeem us to leave us. That God redeemed us to stay with us. He redeems us us. And that is what he's doing in your life. So regardless even where you're at this morning, whatever you're facing where you're at in July 2024, God is using that in your life right now. I couldn't think of a great example, but one, one example is, or kind of analogy is, imagine going out to a really nice dinner. Say you and your spouse. Um, prices have gone up, so you're going to like, have to go up a little bit higher, but let's just say that you're going to go out and you're spending like 300 bucks on dinner. Right? Like 150 bucks a person. And then it comes to dessert. And you get the dessert menu and you're like, dang, dessert's like 25 bucks. Like that's an expensive slice of carrot cake. And you're like, uh, I don't think we should get the dessert. It's like, really? You've already spent $300 and you're going gonna, you're gonna to save 25 bucks by not getting the dessert? Like, no, just go ahead and get the dessert. I heard another guy, uh, I was looking at a commentary, he talked about going to Disney, right? It's like taking your family to Disney. And he's like, imagine you take a family of five, you spend a couple thousand dollars. And then it's like, you get to the parking lot, and it's like 50 bucks to park. He's like, 
Really? You're going to be like, oh, we're going to park down here and walk and, you know, cross the highway and do this. Like, just spend the 50 bucks. Like, you've already spent it. So what he's saying is that God has spared no expense in order to make you a child of him. Why wouldn't you finish the job? God has already made the biggest purchase at the cross. He's going to cover dessert. He's going to cover your parking. If God has put forward his beloved son in our place, he's going to see the ongoing work of our salvation to make sure that it comes to the other side. He will see us through the glory of, that the cross assures of the ongoing, unfailing, everlasting love of God for his sins. That's what this is saying. Brings us to our second question. He says, who can bring a charge against us? Paul continues, verse 33. He says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Again, the answer, anybody know? Nobody. Nobody. Why not? It is God who justifies. It's not you who justifies. It's not your family or your grandparents or something. It's God who justifies. So what we see him doing here again, he's using judicial language, which he's used previously in this chapter. And he's saying this time that no prosecution can succeed. Why? Because God justifies. This is like having the judge and the lawyer on your side. If you ever watch like, crime shows or something, they end up in a court and you're like, if, if you know that, man, they're on this side. Or it's like working for, uh, being on trial, but you work for the mafia. And I'm not implying that that's what, what God did with us, but you know. But you work for the mafia, and it's like, we got the lawyer, we got the judge, like, I'm walking into this thing, and I know that I'm going to get off. Because I've got all the people on my side. And so what he's saying here is you've got the judge, you've got the lawyer on your side. No prosecution can stand against you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing's going to get in the way of that love. Why not? Because when the omnipotent, righteous judge of all the earth says, you're not guilty. And let's, side note, not really tangent. You're not guilty because of his son who came and stood in your place. He says, you're not guilty because one is already taking on your guilt and your shame and your punishment. Then you're not guilty now or ever again. And so Paul's point, simply pointing this back to where we started this series. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is where he left us off last week, verse 30. He says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. <clears throat> What he's saying is the case has been closed. It cannot be reopened. It's been put in the filing cabinet five floors down, and it cannot be reopened. Because if you are a Christ, then you are justified onward, regardless who accuses you. And so this isn't implying that you won't be accused. Once again, you will be. Satan will absolutely accuse you. Satan will absolutely bring up your past. That's where some of us struggle the most. Bring up our past. Bring up how we lived before. Bring up that, that sin that, that maybe still nobody knows other than you and God. Or maybe the sins that you continue to struggle with in your life. And say, say, see, but really? So what do you do when that happens? Return to the gospel. Return to the cross. Remember the verdict. Is Who can condemn us? Nobody. nobody. Who will accuse and try to condemn us? Everybody. Our, our own hearts. I was saying, what about that thing? Right? And that's, I'm not implying that we don't sin, don't mess up, and there's not a need for confession and forgiveness, but it's going to say, all right, you went one too many times, and now God's not going to forgive you. Satan will try to accuse us. Our critics will try to accuse us. Some of your critics will say, I knew you in your life before. All these church people, you put on this smile and you carry this Bible, they only knew you. They knew the version of you that I know. Our enemies will accuse us. Dark forces of evil will accuse us and try to condemn us. But will any of them succeed? Why not? Because God is for us. God justified us. Right? Like, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the ring against God. Right? Think about the Kings match, WWE style. And it's like, eh, never mind. <laughs> Not get in there because God justified us, and the Savior Jesus Christ died for us. He has been raised; He's at the right hand of God, interceding for us. I hope you held on to that this week from this, from last Sunday. That even we don't know what to say in our groanings, the Spirit of God knows what it is that we need when we don't even know, and that the Spirit of God is interceding for us. And so let that verse sink in. Christ died for us. 
Christ died for the sins that would have condemned us, that would have made us guilty. But not only did he die, Christ has been raised. And through his resurrection, he demonstrated that the Father accepted the Son's sacrifice. Which means if you're in Christ, then Christ's victory is also your victory. That's why I tell this passage, the spirit of victory. That yes, Christ has his victory, but now it's also been given to you. Because you are one of God's children. And you get to share in what, you're, in, in, in what your, your sibling Jesus has done. And so this should be one of the most comforting passages, knowing that you are the subject of Christ's intercessory prayers. Regardless of what you're facing, this should provide you a peace knowing that God has each for you. Robert Murray McShane said, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Christians, see how committed Christ is to you? Jesus is more committed to you than you are to him. He has you. When you stumble and fumble, remember that Christ is praying for you unceasingly, fervently, and successfully. Christ is more committed to you than you are to him. Which brings me to our fourth and final question. Who can separate us? Verses 35 to 39. Let's look at 35 first. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Because God is for us, he's told us multiple ways now. We will never be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? And so Paul asked these questions that all basically have the same response, that nothing or nobody can separate us. But I think it's because he's after more than just the right answer. We can all leave here going, nothing can separate us from love, the love of God. Nobody can separate us from the love of God. But I believe he is going after our hearts. He wants us to sink in deep. To penetrate our hearts. So he's encouraging us with these gospel truths. He's reminding us that Jesus is the one who defends us. Have you ever been in a fight? Someone kind of stands up and they, they say, hey, this is my person. Jesus is the one who loves us. Jesus is the one who enters the relationship with us, who initiates that relationship with us. And nothing can separate us from him. That should make you guys smile. I'll say a bunch of sleepy people this morning. Guys, we start at 1030 now. Right? Nothing can separate us. I made two pots of coffee this morning. Go get the stuff you need to. We can hit time out. But Jesus loves you. And he, he initiated this relationship. And nothing can separate us from that love. Right? Here's another relationship you company. You can be separated from the love of someone in your life. Right? I, know, I, I believe God hates divorce. I'm not saying there's not a time this happened. Right? If you're from a family of divorce, right? two people who at one time loved each other no longer love each other. Something separated them. Probably sin. Well, I'd say definitely sin. Sin separated them from love each other. Siblings, right, who, who don't talk to each other any longer. Parents and children who no longer, like, all those relationships, you can be separated from the love of someone. God is the one person, aspect in your life, being, that cannot, you can't be separated. You can turn and try to walk away yourself, right? The thing about the prodigal son story in Luke, but God's love is there for you, welcoming you back. And so we find some fossil separators. She starts listing these out, verse 35. We'll hit these quickly. First, it says tribulation, or your translation might say affliction and distress. That those can, can those separate us? Can outward affliction and inward distress separate us from Christ's love? One may, one may think of Christ's love as absent in these moments. When you're dealing with trouble and affliction in your life, tribulation, you might think, man, God is absent from me. But rest assured, we are not outside the grip of God's grace. Second, he lists persecution. Suffering for the gospel was a reality for the early church. Go back and look at Jesus' first followers, his early followers, how most of them died. It's not very pleasant. It's probably not the way that you guys have on your list. And here's the reality. This is what many of our siblings around the globe face as well. Not all areas, but there are many countries in the world where to be a Christian, we, we watched this documentary on North Korea, and to be a Christian means that you are going to be persecuted. But you are going to be separated and prison the harshest conditions, if not killed. But even persecution cannot separate the faithful witness from the love of Christ. This is all about famine and nakedness. This would be the absence of basic necessities in your life. You know, the temptation we're facing physical needs is to say, does God still love me? 
You know, because if he loved me, I would have, you know, you kind of fill in the blank. Even those things, famine and nakedness, cannot separate us from love of God. Or this is danger. That we're reminded of the reality of living out our faith can be risky. Paul knew this all too well. Paul and David been in danger, persecution, hunger, and more. And then he says the sword. What about the sword? Can, can death by execution, can that mean that a Christian has been separated from the love of God? No, not even that. Not even death can separate us from the love of God. Picks up verse 36. It says, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Here's Paul's point. Suffering is a normal part of the Christian life. Suffering should not surprise us. And when you suffer, never think that God's love has been removed from you. That is the enemy speaking into your life. Say, how's your God now? Does God love you now? It is a normal part of the Christian life. And so we find this central question to the Christian life. One that at the root prompts all of our doubts and all of our worries and all of our tensions. Is there anyone or anything that can separate us from Christ's love for me? No? I see some heads shaking. I see some people mouth at it. No? Because God is always working for the He didn't say we wouldn't go through them, but he provides the ultimate escape from them. And in fact, even in the worst of circumstances, he says that we are more than conquerors. Verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What does that mean? How can you be more than a conqueror? Tom Schreiner says, to be more than a conqueror over affliction, distress, persecution, and so on, indicates that these enemies are actually turned to the good of believers through the power of God. It's kind of pointing back to what it was last week. Even in the midst of the storms of life, do not be deceived, because you can be assured that God is using them for your good and his glory in the midst. Remember verses 28 and 32 from last week. Go back and look at those. And so that we are more than conquerors, that we are going to survive it, that we're going to not just limp and barely make it, but we are going to be more than that because of God, because of the cross. It's the ongoing assurance of Christ's love. And it's, it's what our forgetful hearts need to return to again and again and again. Because I have no doubt that some of you forgot that this week. Because I heard feedback from people last week. I don't get that every week. I heard people like, man, that, this, you know, I'm, yeah, I mean, Paul's point is this. It's like, but some of you forgot that. I have no doubt. And so he would be reminded of it again. Return to it again and again and again. And when you're uncertain, what do you do? Return to the cross. God. But the cross, that reminder for us that God loves us. And he loves us so much that he sent his son to the cross. Finally, in verses 30 and 39, Paul closes with the final celebration of God's love. It says this. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, enter in whatever you want to enter there, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a powerful verse. I'm going to read that again. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, Nothing in all creation will be able to separate from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. God's saying, this is the certainty that I'm giving you. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from Christ's love. Not divorce, not abandonment, not sickness, not the loss of a job, not financial troubles, not the loss of a loved one, and so on and so forth. Nothing can separate us from this. Because you're not faithful. Does that connect? It's based on God's faithfulness. Like God is the one who continues to pursue us. God's the one who continues to love us. Because if you're like me, you wake up days and you're like, God, I just don't feel like a day. I know that Bible's over there, but God, today's going to collect some dust. I don't feel like reading. I don't feel like praying. I don't know what to pray. God's like, I love you. I'm faithful to you. It's based on my faithfulness, not your lack of faithfulness. 
And so we, as a result, can put our hope and security in something that's there every single day. I continue to return to the cross. We're being reminded that God sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. And where you place your hope will determine whether you're able to remain hopeful. Don't place it in yourself. Don't place it in your feelings. Don't place it in your circumstances. Place it in God and God alone. And it's so Jesus. And so here's our recap on God's love and security in Christ. Go to the next slide. That's your cue. Slide guy. <laughs> you guys can answer the first part with me. Who can be against us? No. Nobody. God, having not spared his own son, will give us all things. Who can bring a charge against us? Nobody. Nobody. God has just justified us. Who will condemn us? Nobody. Nobody. Christ Jesus died, rose, and intercedes for us. And who can separate us? Nobody. Nobody. Because God loves us in Christ and has made us super conquerors. Amen? Amen. And so here's how we apply this to our lives. Tony Maria, pastor in uh, Raleigh, helped provide these. But he says four ways that we can apply this text to our hearts and to the hearts of fellow believers. That would include all of us. He says, first, allow these truths. I think I might have this on slide, too. I do. There we go. First, allow these truths to lead you to worship. That this text should cause us to joyful worship. And so in a moment, we'll respond, right? Do what's natural for you. I'm not saying fake it, but be joyful, whatever that looks like. Joyful worship. Whether it's a smile on your face, or I love seeing Joel up here on the cajon, and just like, whatever that is, but joyful worship. Second, allow these truths to lift you from despair. There's three things that typically discourage you in your life. So if you're discouraged right now, it's probably one of these three things as a Christ follower. Sin. There may be some sin in your life. Once again, look to the cross. Christ is taking care of it, but there may need to be some confession of sin. And you can do that to God ultimately, but you may need to do that to somebody else and say, I just need to share this with someone else. I'd like to have prayer over this in my life. I get some form of suffering. Right? That's just the fallenness of life that we live in. You may be going through something. And the third is death. The, the ultimate separation. We must continue to apply, apply these truths from Romans 8, 31 through 39 to our hearts in the midst of these times of despair. Third, allow these truths to show you what unites diverse believers in community. If you notice here, if you go back and read it, the language is plural and it's familial. We see a lot of, we see we and us is emphasized. Right? Now we're American Christians. Why? Because we live in America. And we like to do this, and we read this about my life, how this applies to my heart and my being, right? And there's, that's okay in one sense, but this is given to us collectively. And so he's writing this to us collectively. as I, He was writing there to a diverse audience and a diverse church. And what is it? What united them was the gospel. That's the same thing that unites us as, as a body of diverse believers with different backgrounds different socioeconomic statuses, different ethnicities, but the gospel is what unites us. Fourth, allow these truths to embolden you for mission. And you see, we have this assurance, and you can, you can interpret it. There are people who interpret it and go like, sweet, I'm just to be kind of apathetic in my Christian walk because there's nothing separating from the love of God, so I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to pray. I don't need to Sabbath. I don't need to fast. I don't need to sing. That's not what this is implying. I think you're going to find value in all of those things. Like you know that, that isn't like you don't earn God's love by doing those things, but you grow closer to God. Same way as I go on a date night with my wife and spend time with her, right? We grow closer to one another. That's not the reason that she loves me. But the gospel assurance should actually lead us to gospel advancement. That because of this, we should be willing to proclaim it to all people in the streets of our city and globally around the world. And then finally, because Romans 8 is true, we can plant churches among unreached people groups. We can start a church in a city like Portland. We can boldly proclaim the truths of Christ to a world full of skeptics. We can send missionaries to herald the gospel even in the face of persecution. And we can live everyday, normal, missional lives knowing that we can cry out to our Abba Father at any moment and know, things, know that all things are working together for our good and His glory. And we can suffer now because we know it's temporary and our glory is coming. So be filled with the hope Romans 8. Because your love never fails. Your love never gives up. It never runs out on you. Your love. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your love. God, as we just finished it, we thank you for your love that never runs out. 
God, may the people of Sojourn be reminded this morning of your love. God, we're reminded your love never fails. God, you're the, there's no one else in our life that we can say that about. God, your love never runs out. It's not like we have hit the end of the cage and we have to go get a new one. Your love continues on in this time. God, your love. And so may that impact our hearts as we look at the spirit of victory, God, as the way that we live our lives. And as we forget these things, that we continue to return to your word, specifically to Roman name. Be reminded who we are in you. We love you. So we're going to respond at the table. As we look to the cross, we're reminded of God's love, but then as we come to the table, we're also reminded of God's love. And that this table is a picture of that love and what was represented on the cross. So this way we enter a time of reflection or re reflecting on that love that you can come to the table and as you take the bread that you will be reminded that God's ultimate picture of love requires sacrifice and that it represents the broken body of Jesus on your behalf and my behalf and behalf of the world and to take the juice of the wine and remind that his blood that was spilled for your sins and for the sins of the world. And it is only by his love that we can even come to the table. So take some time to reflect on that. I'm going to make myself available in the back if someone needs prayer or confession or any number of things. If that is available for you this morning, if you'd like me to chat with someone before you come to the table. And so sojourn, table is open, prayer is available. Respond accordingly.
him of your name, justice, and of your goodness. There's no way that we can express how good you are and how much we owe you for all that you've done and all that you are. So take this morning as an offering from us, these, these melodies in our hearts, the words that we have listened to. May we honor you. So take what we've heard today and bring it with us this week to pour out your love from our hearts to this city, to one another. We are your people, we are your church. So use us. Just real quick, I got triple duty this week. <laughs> Church in the park Wednesday. So we'll start park. We've been all summer long, 7 p.m. Uh, we'll have food, fellowship, and uh, hear a story of someone's life and how they've been changed by God. So if you can join us, then we will be there. And then our last announcement is all hands volunteer lunch next Sunday immediately following the service. So we had a volunteer meeting back in May. So it's kind of a follow-up of that, some different things that we've implemented, put in place. And that's also preparing us for uh, for August. And so when it says all hands, essentially it's my way of expressing that one, the church is not one person, it's about Jesus, but it's all of us together, and that we need all hands. So how we can all uh, work together and to serve God and to serve our greater body. And so whether you if you're a current volunteer, then ideally be there. If you're like, I have it, but I'm curious, then try and be there. There is lunch, but you have to let us know that you're like confident that you're going to be there so that we can know how much food to order. And you can do that by emailing amy at sojournpdx.org, or you can just tap her on the shoulder and let her know. She'll start taking notes that you're going to be there. Uh, and then the final announcement, which is not on here, is that part of being a church is sharing all things in common. And Eddie and Courtney walked into this massive basket of, I think it was plums and I don't know what else, but it's huge. I'm assuming that's for us to, to grab and to take. That's just for our breakfast. Oh, that's for breakfast. <laughs> Sorry. So everyone grab some and thank you for the fruit of their of their, of their their labor. Um, and on your not way. labor, it's just our <laughs> uh, tree labor on the way, way out the door. And so let me pray for us. I'll send this out. Father God, we thank you again for the reminder of your love for us. May this sink in deep to each of our hearts and lives this morning. And to be reminded of as that as we go and be the church. Amen. All right, so we'll be the church through our sin.